Good afternoon, everybody. Before Jesus was arrested and crucified, he prayed a prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, asking the Father to assist us, and by us I mean all who have followed God since that time, to assist us in being unified. He knew that this would be one of the biggest struggles that Christians would have, and wow, was he right. We probably live in one of the most divided times in human history, so much so that new divisions are being thought up every single day. People create demographics for themselves so that I'm not just Micah, I'm a straight, cisgender, white, young adult, Christian American male. Oh, so you're a straight, cisgender, white, young adult, Christian American female? That's a difference. And that difference is a division. It's not just something where you're different now, it's something where we are divided. And if you have too many levels of difference or division, this means that we are now enemies. Within a localized group of believers like we are here, there's a lot of things that we have in common. For example, we're all generally from the greater Columbus, Ohio, central Ohio area. And we also share foundational beliefs and worldviews. And we spend like maybe one day a week together. So there's not really a lot of time to get into all of our differences. But one of the biggest differences that we do have amongst ourselves that we can be guilty of turning into a division is age. There is a lot of finger pointing from older people to younger people and younger people to older people trying to account for some of the disagreement that we experience or maybe our disagreement in our understanding or the direction that we're headed or should go. Now, fortunately, in Columbus, I believe that we do a really good job of not making this a huge deal. It seems as if we generally get along across the age demographic, and that is a really good thing to see. However, in the broader church, it is a growing problem. And so I have two goals for this message. Hopefully, if you experience this, where others are struggling with this, where there's differences between age demographics that turn into divisions, you can use this message to minister to them a little bit. And also, as with any good thing in a community, it has to be maintained constantly. So just because we have it doesn't mean we have it forever if we don't maintain it. Ben Franklin is really famous for having been asked at the founding of America, do we have a monarchy or a republic? And he replied, we have a republic if you can keep it. So what have we got today? Community? or division? The answer, hopefully, is community, if you can keep it. Now today I'd like to look at one account that exemplifies what I think is the best attitudes from both an older and younger generation towards each other, hopefully to encourage us to refuse to turn this inevitable difference into something that actually creates disunity between us. If you would, turn with me to 2 Samuel 21. We're going to be in this section for the remainder of the message. 2 Samuel 21, this is well into the kingship of David. We're going to start reading in verse 15. There was war again between the Philistines and Israel. And David went down together with his servants, and they fought against the Philistines. And David grew weary. Now some commentators have actually said that David in this time period could have been around 68 years old, which doesn't sound that old. But when you realize that he was only 70 when he died, And he lived a really rough life of warfare and being chased into the wilderness. 68 probably felt very, very old to David. He had a brutal life. In verse 16, it says, And Ishbi Benob, this is potentially a brother of Goliath, means one who dwells at Nob. Ishbi Benob, one of the descendants of the giants, whose spear weighed 300 shekels of bronze and who was armed with a new sword thought to kill David. Now, some information on this giant here. He is roughly half the size of Goliath. So Goliath's spear was 600 shekels, and this giant's spear is 300 shekels. So he's slightly weaker. He might not be half size, but he's at least carrying half the spear. Some people think that Goliath's spear in total, with the head and the shaft and the counterweight at the bottom, would have weighed roughly 33 pounds which is a ridiculous amount to be throwing at people. And so Ishbi Benob's spear was half that weight. 
And there's some things we can draw from this information being put in here because it specifically says that David grows weary and this giant seeks to kill him and David's compatriots are a little bit afraid of this. What this shows is that while this giant was potentially smaller and maybe weaker and even less intelligent because Goliath, he carried a shield. There was a person carrying a shield in front of him. This giant has a sword. So he's got a spear and a sword. He's all about attack. There's no defense in his mindset at all. So maybe he's a little bit less intelligent. But it shows that David's ability has declined because this person is a threat, even though Goliath wasn't. In verse 17, it says, But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, came to his aid and attacked the Philistine and killed him. Now this was David's nephew. Zeruiah was David's sister. And several times throughout David's life, Abishai is mentioned. Actually, all of the nephews of David are mentioned. And often, it's like they're people with good heart, but they don't think before they do things. They're they're really ready to focus on the sword. And David is a really good balance of sword and peace when it's needed. And so sometimes his his nephews will say, go and attack this person or this nation or this people group. And David says, we don't need to just be attacking all the time. So they're a little bit headstrong. But they did a good thing here. I mean, Abishai here is is killing this Philistine giant on behalf of David. Continuing on, then the rest of David's men swore to him, you shall no longer go out with us to battle lest you quench the lamp of Israel. So look at their high esteem of their king. Remember, this is a man that they had seen the absolute best from and the absolute worst. They'd been there for a good portion of his kingship, a good portion of his life, They've heard the stories. They know the absolute depths that David can descend to. And still that doesn't make them disrespect him. They did not despise him for his inability to carry on fighting as he used to. Instead, they take up the mantle for him. In verse 18, it says this. After this, there was again war with the Philistines at Gob. Then Sibachai the Hushathite struck down Saph, who was one of the descendants of the giants. And there was again war with the Philistines at Gob. And Elhanan, the son of Jare, or Agim, the Bethlehemite, struck down Goliath the Gittite, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. Now, something interesting here, there seems to be a scribal error. Um, 2 Samuel says Elhanan struck down Goliath. 1 Chronicles says that Elhanan struck down the brother of Goliath. The difference here is that in 2 Samuel, it's the Hebrew word et, et, And in 1 Chronicles, it's ahi, A-H-I. Now, those look very different to us, but in Hebrew, those words look almost identical. So clearly, just a simple scribal error turned this from the brother of Goliath to Goliath himself. We know that David killed Goliath. In verse 20, And there was again war at Gath, where there was a man of great stature who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in number, and he was also descended from the giants. And when he taunted Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimei, David's brother, struck him down. So after Abishai rises up, strikes down the giant that's threatening David, the rest of his men see this example and say, yes, we are also going to rise up. We're also going to fight for David. We will also defend his honor. And David let them. He let them. That'd be a hard thing. I know Whenever you try and take the keys away from someone who shouldn't be driving anymore, that's a hard thing. But David lets them fight on his behalf. Verse 22 says, These four were descended from the giants in Gath, and they fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. This, to me, is a really interesting line, because David didn't actually kill any of these giants personally. His younger supporters did on his behalf, but he's given credit Because he killed the first one in his youth. Because they are serving him. And because the kingdom and the army is as much David's as it is theirs. Now there's a lot of stories throughout the Bible that we can use that exemplify this older generation, younger generation mentality. Joshua is the successor to Moses. The younger Israelites go into the promised land, but they need the guidance of the older generation through Joshua and Caleb. And Elisha succeeds Elijah. All of these are fantastic examples of the union that should be between age demographics. So younger generations, we do not need to engage in some sort of power grab 
That cannot be our motivation for what we do. Even if we see things from past generations that bother us or frustrate us, as I'm sure David's men did for him, they never saw David's declining health as a reason to seize control themselves. That wasn't their motivation. It's not what they did. Now, incidentally, as his ability declined, the need for their ability did increase and their glory increased. There's a whole chapter all about the mighty men of David and all the amazing things they did. But they did this on behalf of David. And older generations, it's all right to have a few words of rebuke for us from time to time. We have some inexperience. We're going to be headstrong sometimes. But learn who we are and teach us as brothers and sisters. Show us that you want our success because our success is the continuation of your success. Now, we absolutely have differences, differences of experience or views or opinions or abilities. This is inevitable, but we can't turn these differences into divisions. Instead, let's see where we're different, examine how we might have strengths in our differences to use on behalf of one another to benefit one another. So the younger people, use your strength and your energy and your heart to exercise care for the older generation, recognizing that we need them. And older, use your experience and your wisdom and your established space in this community to establish others who need to carry on the mission of the church. If we can do these things, then when younger or older people who are discontented with the current state of things because of the opposite generation, they can come to you and you can give them some advice. They might ask you, what do we have in the church? Division or community? And you can tell them and show them by your example, we have exactly what Jesus prayed for.